Do I? Do, does this seem like something I want? Hey, can you bring me my cable? This week on Dueling Review, we take a look at Peep Land Number 2, written by Krista Faust and Gary Phillips with art by Andrea Camerini. With the evidence in hand, Mick and Roxy begin piecing... <coughs> with evidence in hand, Nick and Roxy begin piecing together movements of the Central Park Slayer, but the New York City Police Department have another suspect in mind. Meanwhile, the real killer steps up the search for the missing videotape. Hey, yeah. let's talk about sex booths. Let's talk about sex booths. Got to be real clear on your enunciation on that one. What? Booth Booth ease. Ease? Yes. <laughs> well, no, this is an, this is an adult joint. I mean, this, this is, is totally so comic. So peep land number two is mm-hmm. from Titan comics under their new imprint. Hard case, hard crime, case, hard case crime. And the hard case crime stories are very adult in nature and very, uh, crimey in nature. Um, she was a brunette, the kind of brunette that well, she was a, a, she's a kick a hole in a stained glass window. She's a brunette that when she takes her uh, wig off, she's a blonde. Right. So, Issue one kind of sets up the story. And that's one thing I, I, I know about people and right now is if you don't read issue one, you're going to yeah. be lost in issue two. Um, but the gist is there's a um, pornographer, one of those real life pornographer guys back in the 80s. This all takes place in like one 88, of those 86. Somewhere gonzo there. guys who just runs around one of those gonzo porn guys. If you've ever seen Boogie Nights and, you know, mm-hmm. towards the end of his career, the Burt Reynolds character was trying to do the um, the limo porn stuff where they'd pick up people on the street and do that. That's kind of what this pornographer guy does. And he catches uh, a murder on tape and he is killed uh, trying to recover the tape, but he has passed the tape off to a sex booth worker who works in a sex booth shop called peep land. And there are some people trying to get that tape back because it shows off who the murderer is. And the murderer happens to be the son of a very wealthy person. Yes, a, a prominent New York figure to whom no basis of reality well, isn't. <laughs> now, here's the thing, because, uh, you know, yeah. we probably should talk about this. This uh, this yeah. issue is written by uh, Krista Faust and Gary Phillips. Now, Krista Faust, mm-hmm. if you read the back matter of issue two, she talks about her time in New York as a sex worker in these booths during the 1980s. So when you hear about this Central Park Strangler that they're talking about in the book, it seems very much. And I tried to look up Central Park Strangler. There was nothing there, but there was. What was it, Matthew? The uh, Central Park. The Central Park Five. The Central Park Five. And what was the deal with that? They they were going around killing people. No, the Central Park Five was a, a group of young African Americans who were actually arrested. And they were com- they were accused of committing. I think it was a rape and murder. Uh, there was a jogger in Central Park who was killed. Right, right. They were falsely accused. They were falsely, I believe, convicted. Mm, okay. Um, but of course, the convictions were false, and they were based on. Uh, I believe there was some uh, police coercion as well. Again, yeah. I don't know the situation well, really well. Yeah, it's been years since. since but I they do remember, were they I do were remember all that. exonerated. I do remember that. And there does seem to be a Central Park Five setup going on here because um, our main character, Roxy, I believe is her name. Um, she has a fellow sex worker friend who happens to be black and her son gets picked up by being near the scene at the time of this, that this murder is committed. And the cops are saying you and your friends did this. You killed this white girl, you raped her, you did all these things. And so we've got that setup going on and the mother trying to to cope with that. All the while, there is this very wealthy um, man with blonde hair who's rather large, uh, who, you know, the first glance, it's very hard not to say that he looks like a current large political figure in the United yes. States. And who in, in the 1980s would have been an enormous public figure in New York who was actually at least tangentially related to the Central Park jogger case. Mm-hmm. And, so, you know, mm-hmm. now this isn't a jogger that's murdered. It's a schoolgirl no. that's murdered. But, you know, here's somebody trying to cover up for their son who is a wicked, vile uh, person. And it, man, it's just it's fascinating from this point where we're in. We're literally into the second chapter where the thugs that, that are working for Mr. Big, we'll just call him Mr. Mm-hmm. Big. 
um, are looking for the tape and they're knocking over everybody that uh, might have a connection to it. And they found out that Roxy may have the tape because uh, the, the pornographer ran into her booth the night he was murdered and mm-hmm. shoved the tape in there. She took the tape and with her boyfriend, they've discovered who the murderer is. Unfortunately, because the boyfriend's VCR machine, the VHS, you know, back in the right. day, Matthew, that was the, the way yeah, that you had to expensive. watch your videos back in 86. Okay. It definitely was. Um, but, um, uh, they've had to take the tape to a repair guy across the hallway that they know who, who lives in their building because the boyfriend's machine ate up part of the tape and they know that this right. tape is valuable and important and is going to cause a lot of problems. Problem is the, uh, the guy that's going to repair the videotape watches it, sees the murder, sees the very rich, wealthy guy with his mm-hmm. beautiful, uh, uh, trophy wife and their son on TV and is like, Oh, time for me to make some money. Yep. Mr. Went, I believe, is Mr. Big's name. And, of course, he foolishly goes straight to that man's tower. Mm. Oh, yeah, he does have a tower, doesn't he? A whole tower to himself. He he has a tower on Fifth Avenue, and he hands him a copy of the tape and a ransom note requesting $100 or $100,000, $100, $100, $100,000 in unmarked bills. And uh, and then probably, I think, the weirdest slash saddest part of this issue. Not weird. But we get to see all the players, and there are a lot of players in this story. We get to see Christmas Day in Hell's Kitchen, in Uptown, in Midtown, in the Bronx, in Harlem, yeah. uh, in the Meatpacking District. And we get yeah. to see, you know, everyone's lives, the the good, the bad, and the ugly of that. And what I think is a brilliant sequence uh, yeah, in the back of this really, book. Really, really well done. And this whole, uh, this issue especially, but issue one as well, feels very authentic. And, yeah. you know, I don't know what it's like to live in New York in 1986. Well, you know, it was at this, one point the murder capital of the world, definitely in the 70s. I right. think it was still as bad in the 80s until Giuliani cle- cleaned it up, uh, where right. in, in Times Square, um, where today people go and celebrate uh, uh, New Year's Eve, um, right. you know, it used to be the sex district. Well, and, you know, there's also the 90s, all the, the murders moved to Santa Carla, the yeah. new murder capital of Damn the world. Damn vampires. But, but this feels really authentic. It feels like a window into mm-hmm. a lost world. And I can't say that it is, but it definitely feels that way. It's really engaging and it feels incredibly realistic, which is wonderful because there's a lot of different perspectives in here, too. Mm-hmm. I mean, we see we see her friend at her mom's house trying to convince them to maybe go to the church and see if they could raise some money. And the mom's like, nope. You're a terrible mom and your son's a terrible boy and he yeah. deserves everything he gets and, and hate and, face, hate face. Yep, because you're a sex worker. That's because your boy's in trouble. Yep. This is God's punishment. It's just really good. And again, I would really encourage if you didn't read it, Matthew, uh, go and read the two uh, page back matter bit by uh, Krista Faust where she's talking about her time as the sex worker and how um, recently she says I went to um, uh, the New York Comic Con back in October and the city has changed so much that it's hard to remember that this is what – New York used to be like in the eighties. Yeah. It's fascinating. And you're right. So, and that brings this authenticity, this credibility to the story that makes you wonder, are we, do we really know what happened back in <laughs> back then? Maybe she knows something more than, well, I mean, she's letting there's, on. There's clearly an attempt to bring those contemporary themes and, characters into play and i think that's part of the reason that this is so engaging you know if you take into account even if you were to discount the fact that she knows what it's like to work in a peepland this feels like a real story so i mean i i'm in no way assuming anything about anything but it's really great the way there are bits of this that call upon you know, your distant memory and go, I remember Mm -hmm. reading something about something similar Mm -hmm. that actually plays into the story. And that, that gives it that, you know, that true crime feel. Yeah. I don't know if I'd call it noir because noir doesn't necessarily have topless women in it. Well, no, I mean, noir is just dark storytelling and this is certainly dark dark crime storytelling. And I can certainly see it fitting in here. Now, this is a a Philip Philip Marlowe circa 1985. Yeah. Now, this, you know, if you ever go back and watch the um, what is it? Good night, my lovelies for where my lovelies. I forget which which adaptation. Well, my lovely from 1977, 76, something like that. 
Uh, mm-hmm. It's got um, Mitchum, Robert Mitchum in there. That is probably the hardest portrayal of Marlowe that you'll see in movies. And it is violent. It's brutal. It's misogynistic. It's got uh, drugs. It's got nudity. I mean, it is it is hard. I watched it and I was surprised that it came out with Robert Mitchum in the 70s and how good it was. Um, just because they're just saying, hey, let's let's not treat this famous fictional detective with kid gloves. Let's say right. how it was in the books. And it's it's very good. Uh, so now, was it, it is it a period piece in 75 or is it actually contemporary to no, the 70s? It is. It is a period piece. So okay. um, you've got some uh, what is it called? Uh, anachronisms um, mm-hmm. that that pop up in that movie. But it's still very, very good. And they they try to stay true to a uh, late 40s, early 50s uh, story time frame because this is at the end of, of Marlowe's life. Um, right. But very, very good. And I would recommend watching it. Um, is that this, the one with Charlotte Rampling? I don't remember who is the because uh, I love Charlotte Rampling. Uh, let me look up Robert Mitchum on the IMDb. But to talk real quick about the art on this piece, Matthew. Mm-hmm. Oh my God, I'm enjoying this art. It. I don't even know how to describe it because good. Yes, very good. There's elements of like a Peter Chung in here. Mm-hmm. It doesn't. It's not superhero storytelling art. There is not a superhero figure to be had in this. And even the girls who are working as sex workers aren't like idealized. There are points in this where you're just like, man, everybody in this is gross and it's so neat. Yeah. The the art is really well done. But again, this is a mature book. And so you do see nudity. There is language. There is coke being uh, sniffed off of a a hooker's breasts. Um, Mm -hmm. And it, it. doesn't hold back. And that is, that is yep. the surprising thing uh, about this. So, and when Roxy goes to try and get a favor from the neighbor with the good VCR, she has to agree to shoot ads for his phone sex service for him. Yes. Including uh 970 P E E E. The extra E is for is extra, for P. extra P and that's yeah. just gross. Yes. Uh, uh, yes. Charlotte Rampling uh, does play Helen Grail in farewell. My lovely 1975. So Robert I have Mitchum. seen that one. I didn't remember it being Mitchum though. Yeah, it's uh, it's good. Wait, it's, I'm thinking of Joe Don Baker as Mitchell. No, 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 not not Robert. Mi- Robert Mitchum is the one from Cape Fear. That's right. Yes, uh, yes. But watch it if you get a chance. Just watch it. It's really good. I liked it a lot. Very just like I liked. Surprisingly, I like Peep Land too a lot. This is an interesting, engaging adult story. Yes, that I think is is worth checking out. And I and I and I'm I kind of dig that. It, you know, I was hoping that this would have been an American publisher, but Titan Publishing is out of the UK, uh, but they've decided to take on this hard case crime imprint and do harder, more adult uh, tales. And yep. I kind of dig it. Uh, I, I like it. I haven't read all of the uh, uh, I think they have three stories going on right now under their hard case crime imprint. And mm-hmm. if they're like this one, I'm kind of sold. This is really pretty good. So am I. And the thing that's difficult with. With comic book stories specifically is when they try to go dark, adult, moody, noir, oftentimes what you get is something that feels like posing, something that feels like, you know, showing off the the brutality and the the meanness without any heart. Right. And you get, you know, I'm going to say it, you get the Dark Knight Returns. Actually, no, what you get is DK2. Uh, The Dark Knight Returns had some heart to it, but... (laughs) This has heart. This has humanity at the core of it. Right. And I think that that's what really sells it. I mean, it, it's not lewd necessarily because no. if you look at the covers, they are definitely designed to oh, yeah, evoke they're pulpy, the, they're pulpy covers. Yeah, they're to evoke the, the sexy, sexy pulp mm-hmm. novels that my mother's second husband used to read. And that's cool and that's fine. But there's uh, everyone in this from the murder victim to even the evil guy with the bouffant. Everyone feels like a real character and it feels like there are consequences and reality to it. Mm -hmm. So Roxy doesn't feel like, you know, kind of a, Ooh, look, she's a naughty character. No, she's a person trying to get her life together. It's not necessarily working. Her friend's a single mom and that's heartbreaking. Yeah. It's, it's really well done, really well constructed. So the way I look at all the, the grime and the quote unquote filth and the, and the graphic content is it's like, you get up in the morning, you go to the bathroom and take a shower, you get out of the shower and you're standing in front of the mirror and you're naked. Your nakedness 
isn't gross or you know sexy or titillating. It's just life. It's and right, for it's part of- these sex workers who are caught up in this story, their job just happens to be landed in this story. Their 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 job and the fact that they take off their clothes and that right. the uh, ne'er do wells in this story, the Mister Biggs of the story, uh, have sex with hookers. That's their nature. That's what makes this story more, for lack of a better word, more fleshed out. Right. Uh, so it's it's not central to the story. So if you're going in here going, oh, yeah, we're going to see lots of boobies and lots of sexy <laughs> sex going on. It doesn't have that, at least especially yeah. not in the second issue. First issue has a little bit more uh, yeah. sexual talk and, in, and innuendo stuff because it does take place in the sex shop when uh, the pornographer guy comes in to drop off the tape. Right. And the nudity and the sexuality that is there is what I like to call Requiem for a Dream sexuality. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. It's not fin- fin- final, there for... Final scene, Requiem for a right. Dream, yeah. It's it's not there for your enjoyment. It's part of the story, and in a lot of ways, it's, it's you know, it's not that horrifying. Yeah, no, no. But it's meant some of it to be very horrifying and mm-hmm. very off. So that is, uh, I'm giving a thumbs up to uh, Peep Land number two from Titan Comics. Uh, go check it out. The art uh, by Andrea Camarini is really yeah. good. And the story is good, too. And I, and I think I'm going to finish this series as it plays yeah. out over the next couple of months. So am I. I hope they keep sending it to us. Yeah. Oh, I'm sure they will. That's Titan. They're, they're pretty good. Um, nice. Coming out next week from Dark Horse Comics, we have Aliens Defiance number seven, Predator versus Judge Dredd versus Aliens number three. <laughs> Why am I only finding out about this now? Predator versus Judge Dredd versus My Little Pony. Oh, man. Wouldn't that be great? IDW, get right. on that. Uh, Dark Horse Comics also has World of Tanks number three out next week. DC Comics has Aquaman number 12, Batman number 12, Batman 66 meets Steed and Mrs. Peel number six of six. Uh, (laughs) There's a lot of sixes in there. There are a lot of sixes in there. We also get uh, Cyborg number six. (gasps) Flash by Mark Wade, trade paperback, volume one. Go get that. It's a $25 book. I I would really seriously. Uh, I believe that is the whatever Wade's first run in in the story was. Born to Run is Wade's first arc, I believe. Then that will be in there. Definitely worth picking up. Nice. Flintstones number six, Green Lantern number twelve, Injustice, Gods Among Us, Year Four, Trade Paperback, Trade Paperback Volume Two. Oh, Matthew, get your hands on that. There's also Injustice Ground Zero number one, and Superman number twelve. Superman number twelve. And that's the old new Superman, not the new old Superman. I don't know which one is which any now, because I know the the post the new rebirth Superman. No, no, the post rebirth Superman is dead, right? Because he blew himself up. The new Fifty Two Superman is dead. Okay. The post rebirth the- Superman is actual Superman before right. Fifty Two Crisis on Infinite Earths. I believe if you look at the time frame, he is actually post Crisis Superman. Because he's married to Lois Lane, which didn't happen until oh, 95. Right, right. right. So, so he's this the is... Superman from uh, DCU Prime Earth. Yes. Mm, it's so confusing. Well, it could be worse. I mean, you go back any further and you got Earth 1. There's six different places called Earth 2, Stephen. Yes. IDW Publishing has Atomic Robo in the Temple of Odd number 5 or Ood number 5. The Duck mm-hmm. Avenger number 2 from Disney Comics. Mickey Mouse number 15. Jack Kirby Pencils and Inks Hardcover. That's a $50 book. But might be worth checking out. Micronauts Uh, number eight also arrives next week, as does Star Trek New Visions Special Edition uh, Volume Four. I'm not sure I like those New Visions books. Yeah, where they just basic well, they basically just take the video, you know, take stills from the from the show or from the movie, and then they just put words on top of it. It Just seems weird. It's a a fumetti, man. I guess. It's a European thing, man. Fumetti is like a, a well and truly crafted uh, device. Yeah, but you know what? I bet if Just you did not it, in America. I bet if you did it and put it up on the web, people would call you like plagiarizer. No, you have the rights to use it. I mean, Paramount owns those stills. And no, but I'm saying if you around. did that, if you did that. Well, sure. I don't own them. Yeah. But here's the thing. You know what it does? It gets around that eternal question of why doesn't Scotty look like Scotty? It's an actual freaking picture of Scotty. That's true. That's true. That's true. How bad can it be? It's a picture of Scotty. Yep. Image Comics has Arclight number three, Cannonball, or yeah, can no Cannibal number three. Cannonball. Uh, Cannonball. Eclipse number yeah, four, you. Glitter Bomb yeah, number four, Cannonball. Motor Crush number one, Ringside number eight, Violent Love number two, 
and Wicked Divine number 24. Marvel Comics has the all-new Marvel's Uncanny number one, Champions number three, Clone Conspiracy three of five. Ooh, Clone Conspiracy. Uh, Conspiracy. Monsters Unleashed tie-in postcards. You get a bundle of 100 of those for five bucks. Monsters Unleashed tie-in postcards. You know, um, what is, I, I, I was just, you know, right now Marvel is just like, Monsters Unleashed, Monsters Unleashed. There's a Monsters Unleashed party coming to your local comic book store. Monsters right. Unleashed, a whole new look at monsters in the Marvel Universe in the new right. 2016s. They seem to be right. putting an awful lot on Monsters Unleashed. Well, it's their new big deal. I mean, they they do this. They throw their weight behind different initiatives and different things, and some stick and some don't. You had uh, Marvel Now. You had Nero's Reborn. You had Marvel Now again. Marvel Now Air Now. Are you looking forward to um, Marvel Kaiju attack the Marvel Universe? Eh, maybe. I like I'm some kind of, of those, interested uh, in it. I like those guys like Gugam, Son of Goom, and Zutak, and mm-hmm, those guys. Mm-hmm. You know, they have some soul. The interesting thing is they're, you know, as as cool as those Kirby characters were when he was drawing them. Mm-hmm. Um, they. I, I watched a video today. It's up on the Major Spoilers website where you can go behind the scenes of Monsters Unleashed, where they're talking to the creators and they're basically, they talk to all these great artists that are part of Monsters Unleashed and basically said, imagine these monsters for the new age and make them scarier and creepier than before. So you're going to have um, Francesco Francavilla doing a cover, Steve McNiven, Mike Mignola, Art Adams is doing a lot of the uh, art for this series. Uh, Steve McNiven is working on this as well. It's going to be interesting and I can't wait to see I can't wait to see how they spin this story because, I mean, we've seen Fing Fang Foom uh, recently in the series the and we've tank. seen Groot, uh, you know, uh, Guardians of the Galaxy. Yeah. Groot actually Groot's started a huge deal. as one of the uh, monsters, right, of from the Monsters yep. Unleashed line. The Prince of Planet X. Yeah. And so it'll be interesting to see what happens when you have more of these monsters yeah. uh, come and those, attack. Those pre-code monsters have been in and around the Marvel Universe. I mean... Uh, Zemnu the Hulk is one. There's a bunch of these guys that keep popping up repeatedly because they were created by Kirby and Ditko and and Stan Lee in the 50s when superhero comics didn't sell. So that's kind of neat. Yeah. Uh, Star Wars uh, Kanan Omnibus uh, hardcover comes out next week, as does Unworthy Thor number two of five. In all the rest category, we have Adventure Time number 59. Now that that series is over, I think the only place you're going to get Adventure Time is in your comic books. Is it over, over? I thought it was over in 2017. I think they're done with the production of it. Maybe I'm thinking of a uh, regular show. Maybe that's the other one. They're both ending, right? Uh, I know regular show is, yeah. Uh, Belladonna number three comes out. Big Trouble in Little China Escape from New York number th- uh, number three comes out. That'll be a lot of fun. Uh, for those Big of you trouble that got your, in Escape from Little China. Yes. Uh, for those of you that got your loot crates this last month, you got the first issue of that. Uh, yeah, so I enjoy. did. What'd you haven't think? Did you like yet. it? Oh, you haven't read it? I haven't read it yet. No, it's, it's wrapped in a bag. Oh, okay. We also have Faith uh, number six next week. Flash Gordon King's so Cross number have two. Faith, faith, faith. Oh, boy. Um, let's see. What else do we <laughs> well, have? I guess week? it would be nice. Puppet Master number 19. Back Reggie back and Me number one. Ooh, you, that's a good one. Would you like to guess how many uh, um, covers there are for this one? Reggie and me? I'm going to say nine. There are ten. Ooh. There is the Reggie sexy variant. The Reggie no. sexy nude variant. No. There is not. <laughs> the sexy Reggie wraparound there is variant. There's not a wraparound. <laughs> now there, if there's a Reggie wraparound torture cover like on Crossed, maybe. Oh, no. There are no <laughs> nude variants in Archie Comics. Uber Invasion and if there number were, one. They wouldn't be on this book. Oh, and here's one that I know you're going to be excited about Wonder Woman 77 meets Bionic Woman number one of six. <gasps> this I is a collaboration between DC Comics and uh, Dynamite Entertainment. So you'll want to go check that out. Who's drawing that? I don't remember. I know that the. I uh, want to say that Colleen Doran did a cover. Well, I know uh, you're, the main cover is. No, that's a 15. The very expensive one is an Alex Ross cover. Stags is doing the main cover. Cat Stags, okay. Yeah, like and it. then uh, Ross is doing the B backup cover. Then there's an action figure cover, a coloring book cover, and a blank Authentics cover for ten dollars. I don't know what that means. Which means but... you can draw your own Authentics, my friend. Oh, okay. 
next week on Dueling Review. Dirk Gently, Salmon of Doubt number three. Plagued by nightmares about a childhood he never had. Dirk Gently discovers a holistic detective can have more than one past, and his adventures have only just begun. Featuring favorite characters from the original books as well as the cast from the TV series, including Samuel Barnett and Elijah Wood, you guys! You can show your support for this show and everything we do at Major Spoilers by becoming a patron at patreon.com slash major spoilers. Listen, your contribution allows us to make sure that this show keeps going week after week. And if you love independent podcasters, if you love the spirit of independent creation, then head to patreon.com slash major spoilers and sign up today. Heck, even if you don't sign up today, go over to patreon.com slash major spoilers and check and see what we have, because there's a lot of stuff there that you get to have as you become a Patreon member. Um, and of course your pledge gives us the motivation to produce more content for you each and every week. Thank you so much for checking out Dueling Review and we will talk with you next time when you will hear Matthew say Ita Gramupovets. This podcast is copyright 2016 by Major Spoilers Entertainment LLC.